The first sign was a faint tinkling in the distance, from no particular direction. The sound of a marina of halyards flicking on metal masts. Drifts of specks appeared above the horizon ring. Each speck became a goose. Flocks were converging on the pond from every compass point, a diaspora in reverse, snow geese flying in loose V's and W's, and long skeins that wavered like seaweed strands, each bird intent on the roost at the centre of the horizon's circumference. Lines of geese broke up and then recombined in freehand ideograms, kites, chevrons, harpoons. I didn't move. I just kept watching the geese, the halyard yammer growing louder and louder, until suddenly flocks were flying overhead, low over the shoulder, the snow geese yapping like small dogs, crews of terriers or dachshunds, urgent sharp yaps in the thrum and riffle of beating wings, and the pitter-patter of goose droppings pelting down around me. They approached the roost on shallow glides, arching their wings or, and holding them steady, or flew until they were right above the pond and then tumbled straight down on the perpendicular. Sometimes whole flocks circled over the roost, thousands of geese swirling round and round as if the pond were the mouth of a drain and these geese the whirlpool turning above it. Nothing had prepared me for the sound, this dense, boisterous din, the clamour of a playground at break time, a drone thickness flecked with high-pitched yells, squeals, hollers and yawps, the entire prairie's quota of noise concentrated in Jack's holding pond by the two-storey house and the raised lake stocked with bass for fishing. I breathed it in. It was seven o'clock. There was a half-moon. I waited until the birds were settled, then drove back slowly along the farm tracks, leaving the headlights off until I reached the highway. So that was the first time I saw geese, and that was in Texas, in was the end of February or the beginning of March. And they were starting to fly north. And as they started to fly, I would get in a greyhound bus and go north with them. And snow geese, like most waterfowl, tend to migrate via recognised staging areas, particularly wetlands, where they'll set down and feed up and get strong and then wait for the temperature, the isotherm, the temperature of the spring to proceed north ahead of them. Uh, so I would get on a Greyhound bus and go on to the next staging area up into South Dakota and then up across the border into Canada and so on. When I was first having this idea of this journey, I thought it was going to be this wonderful, sort of fluent, clean arc from one place to another. Um, and in fact, I can not reckoned on quite how sensitive to weather snow geese are. I mean, they're really sensitive. If there's any snow or storm, they hold back. And sometimes they even undertake what are called retreat migrations, where they'll actually go back south to avoid the cold weather. So quite often I would have gone on a Greyhound bus and arrived in South Dakota and find that there'd been a storm or that the weather was very bad and that I was, you know, 500 miles ahead of the geese. And I'd have to wait in these motels in the middle of nowhere for, for the geese to arrive. In fact, that reminds me of when I, the first time I talked about the book publicly was on, um, was on Midweek, Lily Purvis's radio programme. And I was on it with uh, John Gordon Sinclair, the actor who'd been Gregory's Girl, a uh, Scottish actor. And I told this story about how annoying it was that I was kind of stuck in the middle of nowhere waiting for these geese. And he said, um, he said, yeah, I've spent a lot of time waiting in motels, waiting for birds to show up. <laughs> <laughs> Which was, I thought it was great. But so I, I, moved gradually, I moved gradually north. I edged my way north um, with the spring. And, and then suddenly I was up in Winnipeg in Canada and then taking the train north for three days across the, the Canadian, across the boreal spruce forest of northern Canada, getting to Churchill on the edge of Hudson Bay where the sea was frozen. The first time I'd seen a frozen sea and then making one more leap across to Cape Dorset in Baffin Island where the geese were going to start to nest and spend the summer. That was the arc of this journey. And afterwards it became a kind of structural principle for this book, The Snow Geese. But I don't think it's a, a particularly a book about geese. Really what I found was that it was a way for me to write about certain human longings that I thought were universal longings. The idea of home, our home feeling, our tropism towards the home place, towards 
the known place and um, a correspondent restlessness to move away from it um, and return to it. It was about those ideas, about return and homesickness and nostalgia. And so I was able to weave through this story of the journey various other narratives, an autobiographical, almost like a novel, a story of this illness and, and recovery and convalescence, story of the science behind bird migration, how people discovered how the compasses work in birds' brains and bodies, how they navigate across these great distances, how those different compasses have evolved. Uh, but also the story of nostalgia, itself, which um, has an entire history, uh, you know, nostalgia, um, the word was coined in um, the uh, late 16th century by a Dutch doctor called Johannes Hofer, um, to be a medical designation for the symptoms of homesickness. He used the Greek words nostos, which means return, and algos, which means suffering, return suffering. Um, and it was a real problem through the 17th and 18th centuries particularly, Nostalgia was the biggest problem for military doctors. People were dying of nostalgia. Um, Hofer, Hofer's time in the early 17th century, it was believed that nostalgia particularly afflicted the Swiss because they lived up high in the mountains and when they moved away from their home, they came down, the atmospheric pressure increased. That increase of pressure produced certain symptoms of melancholia and malaise and so on. Um, so the book became really a story of, of, um, of this universal idea of home and the exploration of that idea. At the same time, there's another story going through, which is a story of, of people, of various characters encountered on the way, on the way north. Um, and obviously I was travelling for maybe three months or so, and I had many, many encounters, but I haven't written about very many encounters. The point of writing the book wasn't to write a kind of blow-by-blow Count wasn't to write a sort of travel log. wasn't that, that wasn't the idea really. I wanted to be quite selective in what I wrote about. Um, so I I focused on maybe five or six people that came into my life on this on this journey because the stories they told all had some bearing on this theme on this home idea. And just before I stop, I want to read um, just introduce you to that kind of strand of the book, just to one of these people.